Chapter 34, The One Thing We All Know. A few things remain the same in this new world. One, I still fight with Kushal, or rather he fights with me and I oblige him. We fight over who gets the front seat on the way to school. We fight over what station to listen to on the radio. He tells me I have a big nose. I tell him he is fat. He tries to give me a punch when we pull up in front of his school, and I lock the door as he tries to get out. I may be an advocate for free speech and human rights in public, but with my brother, I admit, I can be a dictator. Two, Moniba and I have gone back to our silly old feuding. We Skype as often as we can, but we seem to start each chat the same way. Oh, Malala, she says, you've forgotten all about me. And I say, Moniba, you're the one who's forgotten about me. After we've gotten that out of the way, we get down to having a good gossip. Sometimes talking with Moniba and my friends at home makes me more homesick. I can almost smell the wood smoke drifting up from the valley or hear the horns honking on Haji Baba Road. I've seen many other places, but my valley remains to me the most beautiful place in the world. I'll, I will go back to Pakistan eventually, but whenever I tell my father I want to go home, he finds excuses. No, Johnny, he says. Your medical treatment is not complete. Or, these sco schools are good. You must stay here until you have learned all you can. He doesn't say the one thing we all know. It'll be a long time before we can go home. Going home is the one thing we don't talk about, especially now that Fazlullah has risen from the head of the Taliban in SWAT to the head of the Taliban in all of Pakistan. I know this new life is sometimes hard for my brothers. They must feel as if a giant wind suddenly picked them up in Pakistan, blew them across the globe, and set them down here in this foreign place. As for Atal, he doesn't understand all the media fuss around me. I don't understand why Malala is famous, he said to my father. What has this girl done? To the world, I may be Malala, the girl who fought for human rights. To my brothers, I'm the same old Malala they've been living with and fighting with all these years. I'm just the big sister. My mother, though, sometimes treats me as if I'm the baby, not the oldest. She can be very protective, and sometimes, out of nowhere, she'll come over and hug me and cry. I know she's thinking about how she almost lost me. Often I catch sight of her wandering in the garden out back, her head covered by her shawl. She feeds the birds from leftovers she keeps on the windowsill, just as she used to do back home. I'm sure she is thinking of all the hungry children who used to eat breakfast at our house before school in the morning and wondering if anyone is feeding them now. Sometimes my father cries, too. He cries when he recalls those first days after the attack, when I was somewhere between life and death. He cries at the memory of the attack itself. He cries with relief when he wakes up from an afternoon nap to hear his children's voices in the yard and realizes that I am alive. <clears throat> I don't get angry very often, but I do get angry when people say he is responsible for what happened to me. As if he forced me to speak out. As if I didn't have a mind of my own. If they could see him now. Everything he worked for almost over 20 years has been left behind. The school he started from nothing. The school that now has three buildings and 1,100 students. He used to love nothing more than to stand at the gate and greet the children in the morning. The Kushal school carries on, and each day students pass through that gate, but he is not there to see it. Instead, he goes to conferences on girls' education, and he speaks out for peace as he used to do in SWAT. I know it's odd for him now that people want to hear from him because of me and not the other way around. Malala used to be known as my daughter, he says, but I'm proud to say that now I am known as Malala's father. It's not safe for us to go to Pakistan, that is true, but one day when we were homesick, we realized we could bring Pakistan to us. Friends and family come to visit, and Shazia and Kanat, who both go to college in England, stay with us during the holidays. My mother is much happier when she has a house full of guests and extra chairs around the dinner table. As her happiness grows, so does her willingness to try new things. She has begun to learn English again. She has also begun appearing in public without her shawl covering her face and has even allowed herself to be photographed. My father, meanwhile, has taken on a new responsibility at home. Recently, I teased him that while he and I are busy speaking about women's rights, my mother is still doing the cooking and cleaning. Now, he cooks every morning. It's the same thing every time, fried eggs. His cooking is full of love, but not so full of flavor. He has done some brave things in the past, starting a school without a coin in his pocket, standing up for women's rights and girls' education, and standing up to the Taliban. But now my brave, proud Pashtun father has taken on the pots and pans.